Hello, everybody. Uh, today we have a very interesting guest with us, uh, Jose Humberto Gomez Rodriguez. He is a former tourist guide uh, who was working since the 1950s here in Yucatan, uh, especially in the area around Chichen Itza. And he is also the discoverer of uh, many uh, great archaeological finds in Balancanche caves near the archaeological site of Chichen Itza, which we all know so well. Thank you for being here with us. Don it's Humberto. my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, what should I call you? Everybody calls me Beto. All right. It's a nickname for Roberto. Okay, so we'll go with Beto. Okay, fantastic. So anyway, uh, I, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, how you first got involved in the tourism industry. Um, we're talking back in the 1950s, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, what really happened is that um, my grandmother was related to the Barbachanos family. And normally, every year, during summer vacations or winter vacations, she used to go and stay over there for maybe a month or two or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I was about eight years of age when, for the first time, she took me over. And I stayed that first vacation and became to be something that I kept on doing every year. Summer and winter vacations, I used to spend them at Chichen Itza. <clears throat> and of course, at that time, Chichen Itza was entirely different as to what it is today. I enjoyed very much going to the Hacienda and ask for a horse to have it saddled and going to the woods. There was nothing else to do but to go and explore. And there was nothing more interesting for me at the age of 10, more or less, than to get lost in the woods and find the unrestored buildings. It didn't recall my attention too much of the Castillo or the Temple of the Warriors that was being restored, but it recalled my attention the buildings that were in the middle of nowhere, completely covered by vegetation, with fallen down stones, many of them with carvings. Mm -hmm. So that was fascinating because practically I was discovering something. For me, it was a new hope. And that was probably an introduction into what eventually became to be something that I really enjoyed. That was history, anthropology, archaeology, and explain to people what I had seen. That's right. It, it I mean, really became uh, kind of a, a preview of what was to come for the rest of your life. That's in, right. In, 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 a, in a lot of ways. That's right. What kind of awareness did you have? Of, I mean, at 10 years old, I as well had an interest in archaeology, but it, it was kind of not very, as we would say in Spanish, asentado, right? Mm -hmm. I had this, this notion of people in the past, but no, no real kind of concrete idea. What was going through your head back then when you were... Well, probably what was a great influence also were, for one thing, the very few tour guides that were at that time mm -hmm. that were quite open. I used to explain you a lot of things that for me were fascinating. That was entering into a new, a new world other than the primary school that I was going to. And another thing that was very important was that I made very good friendships with all the, uh, the workers in the hotel, especially the gardeners. I enjoyed very much to see them every single uh, morning around 11 o'clock. I used to go all the way around the grounds around the hotel mm -hmm. and see where they were. They used to gather themselves to enjoy the pozole, the corn drink, mm -hmm. and I used to sit with them. And it was fascinating the things that they were telling me. Many of them must have been lies. <laughs> Tall tales. But to me, they were very interesting. I was, I was licensed to be a tour guide in 1956. Wow. October 1956, exactly. I was licensed to be a tour guide. Oh, and you have it right here. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, 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 we'll definitely get that get that on screen. That, that's excellent. These are the new ones. Are, These are the new ones, are yeah. Terrible. <laughs> These are the old ones. 
Excellent. Actually, my first teachers were in Merida. Mm -hmm. One of them was uh, the archaeologist Manuel Cirilor Sansores, who was at that time representing tourism in Yucatan. And the second person that was very, very important was the director of the Museum of Yucatan that was downtown, uh, uh, Cantor Lopez, Professor Cantor Lopez. Mm -hmm. Actually, what happened was that uh, they were going to have a guy's school in Yucatan at that time, but I was doing some work for the Barbacanos family. I used to go to, to Isla Mujeres, uh, maybe once a month or something like that, to investigate how the coconut uh, growing was, what was being developed. And I didn't assist enough uh, times to go to the school. And as a result of that, I was expelled. <laughs> I, could, I, could, I couldn't continue going. And finally, I went to see uh, Senor Sansores, Senor Sansores, uh, Senor Cantor Lopez, and I told him what I wanted. I wanted to become to be a tour guide. And uh, they said, do you really like that? I said, yes. Okay, they're going to give you one month training. One month. But you have to dedicate yourself to, to do what you, are, what you like, to be a tour guide in that one month. And they will pass, then you will pass exams. So I remember very well with Senor uh, Senor Sansores, it wasn't that difficult because it was only about uh, architecture, about the space of the buildings, more, more of, of what I had to learn and explain was practically the looks of the buildings, what they were used for, and that was it. What was really uh, difficult was in the museum where I passed the test because uh, I remember that uh, the professor said, this is going to be your only chance. I don't have time to give you more another month. So you're going to pass your exam right now. And I was ready with my pen and everything to write. Said, no, 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 you are not going to write anything. We are going to go around the museum. So we went, I was following him in the museum. And all of a sudden he said, what's that? And then I have to say, that is a vase that uh, looks to be from the pre-classic times because of this and the other, no? Okay. Kept on walking. What's that? Well, that's a colonial. And that was the way of making the exam. How old were you at this point? I was about 18. But I came. Yeah. So therefore, that was by the time we ended, he said, you did your work this last month, huh? <laughs> so finally, two of them gave me uh, written letters and I went to Mexico City and I passed the exams over there with these two letters. And uh, I stayed only for about three days and I came back with my license. And maybe you believe it or not, but I made an investigation and uh, I'm the only one who's alive with the license of the 1500s. Of the 1950s. Uh, huh? Of the 1950s. No, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the number of the... Oh, oh. Of the, <laughs> The number of the license oh, I see. Is, is 1503. Okay. And I made an investigation. There is none. No one else. The 1500s that is active. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that's why I have it. That's quite that's a... I keep it close to your heart. That's right. <laughs> Just for people who might not be aware, you, you've uh, spoken a fair amount of the, about the Barbachano uh, family. Could you please uh, tell our audience a little bit about who the Barbachanos are uh, and especially who they were and what they meant to the tourism industry here in Yucatan. Uh, Don Fernando Arbachano Peón practically was the initiator of tourism uh, in the whole of the southeast of Mexico, for sure. Uh, they, were the, they were the owners of uh, the archaeological site of Chemisa, practically, mm -hmm. because it was within the grounds of the hacienda that they owned. They are the ones who developed the Maya Land Hotel, uh, developed Uxmal también as a, an attraction for tourism. And we can say that the Barbachanos family was at that time, and is even today, very well recognized for being the initiators of tourism in Yucatan. I understand 
that Fernando Arbachano Peón actually used to go to Progreso and used to go to uh, Chukchulú in order to get people from the, from the ships, ships, mm -hmm. small ships, to bring them into Mérida to develop an interest in the archaeological sites. So the influence of the Barbachanos family is very well known for the tourism that we are having today That's in, right. in Yucatan. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity of working for Don Fernando Barbachano Peón, for his son, Fernando Barbachano Gomez Rul, and I also did a little bit of work for Fernando Barbachano Herrero, who is the actual owner of the Maya Land Hotel. So I did work for three generations mm -hmm. in the Barbachanos family. Well, I certainly have not been around <laughs> as long as you have um, in Chichen Itza and doing all this wonderful work. But even I recall, you know my father, Jorge Carlos Rosado Baeza. And, uh, you know, when I was a, a little guy uh, back in the uh, 80s, I would go with my father on tours to, to Cuba and to Chichen Itza and some further fun places uh, and sometimes even by Cessna back then, because there was no roads into places like Coba. And even just looking back into the 80s, into my own youth, I see how much the tourism industry has changed in my lifetime. So I can't imagine what it might, must be like for you and the, and the changes you have seen. Do you have any reflections, any thoughts yes. on, on that? Yes, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you as an example, my first trip, to Palenque was precisely in 1956 with one person, one person. You had to go from Mérida to, to Campeche by car. You had to take the train in Campeche about 12 o'clock at noon time. The train was to arrive to Palenque approximately by two, three in the morning, all day long and all night long in the train, and you were picked up by a jeep owned by a Frenchman who to take you to the, to the hotel, the hotel <laughs> in Palenque, uh, and that hotel only had 11 rooms. Um, that was the Hotel La Croix. The owner was Don Domingo La Croix. Uh, that gives an idea uh, as to how many hours you have to travel in order to get to Palenque, which now can be done in almost no time. Mm -hmm. uh, what concerns Chichen Itza, the road to, to go to Chichen Itza originally is not the, road, the one that we take today. It used to go through Tinum, from Tinum to Chichen. So actually there was no road going in the highway or the freeway or the toll road, mm -hmm. nothing like that. No piste. <laughs> and when I started going to Chichen Itza as a young boy, we didn't have buses. We had wawas. The wawa is like a like a truck. Mm -hmm. yeah. Practically and on the on the top there was a rack to put all the luggage. If it rained everything got wet. And the road only went as far as Libre Union. So going from here to the Chen Itza was almost about three and a half hours. Yeah, Libre Union is basically where you turn to um, Yaxuna. That's quite a ways away. That's right. That's right. That's what it is. Uh, that's, that's as far as the, as the, the white road went. Mm -hmm. The rest of it was almost impossible to go. Uh, so practically, the Chen Itza was in the middle of nowhere. And I don't remember one, one, one story. Maybe, maybe you will laugh out of this because that, that includes your grandfather. Oh yeah, <laughs> Don Humberto. Mm -hmm. I remember precisely with that man that I went to Palenque. He sent me to Esna. Esna was almost unknown at that time. I went with this man in a private boat. I had to be handled for him. And he wanted to go to Tulum. And the only way of going to Tulum was by plane from Merida. So they hired a the little plane, only the pilot, the co-pilot, and myself sitting in the back. I remember that after I finished that tour, 
all those, those three tools I presented to your grandfather. My invoice, that was not an invoice, a piece of paper. And he looked at it and he said, ah, hey Beto, this about Palenque, it's okay. This about, uh, it's not, well, it's okay. But this about Tulum, it's too high the price. And I said, on Humberto, I said, now look, I said, if something happened to the train, I could walk. If something happened to the boat, I could swim. <laughs> but if something happened to the play, I, I, I had to learn how to fly. <laughs> Not yet. So, so, so he laughed and he said, it's okay. He signed it. Signed it away. And I was paid. And uh, with regard to the uh, visitors, the tourists themselves, um, you, you must see some pretty big differences from the way it was back into the 50s to into the 60s, rolling into the 70s and 80s. And, and today, what, what, what differences do you see in the people that come to Yucatan uh, to visit the archaeological sites? In order to establish a difference between these, these various epochs or times, we have to, to realize also the difference in the means of transportation. Because originally, the only means of transportation were automobiles. So you had three, three people, four people at the most in a, in a car. So, pri so practically, the services were private services. You attended two people, three people, four people. If you had a group of 15, then you had to have like th uh, three, three to five cars. A convoy. Depending, a convoy, that's all. And uh, then you were looking after the 15 people with no problem. But the transportation had to be very carefully uh, arranged so they could go in a, as a convoy. And that them. would increase the price considerably as well. Right. And within the time, then we started having automobiles, bigger, larger. Uh, we started having buses. And then the, the tools became more massive. Logically, the prices were, were lower because you were using bigger vehicles. Now, concerning the people, I would say that uh, before, in 1990s, all the people that came down to Chichen Itza came with the interest of knowing the history of the Mayas. That's why they stayed at least at the minimum one night overnight in Chichen. But two nights or three nights. And I do remember that we used to go morning tour, afternoon tour, morning tour, afternoon tour, a morning to for for those three nights that you were staying there. It wasn't like going over and seeing everything in a couple of hours. So you had to divide up your times. And of course you were more accessible to the closeness to you to what you were showing. You didn't have to see things in the far distance. Uh, when did when tourism became to be more massive then people became to be less, I wouldn't say less interested, but less detail interested mm -hmm. on, the, on the Maya culture. It became a day trip. They come on a day trip, they just want to take a bird's look, see what's going on, enjoy it. Get a picture. Have their picture taken, climb if they could climb, and that was it. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, then we started having misbehaviors in the uh, in the way of behaving of the people as a result of that laws had to become to be more strict but the place started losing the enchantment that it had in the earlier times i'm sorry son, if i may have a, if i have to say this but there are times when chichen itza because of all the things that are being sold in the interior looks like a laundry with all kinds of uh, uh, articles of dressing hanging here and there, no? Pickford Steeler that ponchos. Is not, that's nothing <laughs> yeah, that should no. be in there. Mm -hmm. Nothing. I'm sorry for saying it, but that's true. It is It is true. And and a lot of people now are seeking out these experiences, which were more like what Chichen Itza used to be, but having to go further out into the jungle, into the brush. That's and, right. And visiting these places. And those experiences are still possible, just not Chichen Itza. That's right. 
so probably, probably places that were not very uh, commonly visited some years ago, like Chakmultun, like La Repuk Zone, as an example, uh, and other places which are very interesting will be visited very soon. But what can I tell you about tourism? What I can tell you is this, that tourism is a, is a war tank that starts going and going and going and pushes and pushes. So I go someplace today and I find it to be a paradise. And I tell my neighbor, and I tell him, it's so beautiful, don't tell people. It's what I tell him, it's other neighbors. And when I go back to that place ten, five years later, it's not going to be a paradise anymore. Yeah. It's going to be crowded with people, but that cannot be stopped. That's part of progress. We have to accept it and deal with it. You know? That's why it's, for me it's very nice to remember the way tourism was 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I am more than 60 years in tourism and I have seen all these various changes. You know? I was active until about a year and a half ago, but I was feeling that I had mm -hmm. to, to move away and do nothing, <laughs> really. I would like now to uh, move on to, to another topic. Um, you mentioned uh, when you were young, on horseback, uh, exploring and discovering for yourself all these uh, wonderful places around Chichen Itza. Well, some years later, during the 1960s, I believe it was, you, you were responsible for some really uh, significant discoveries, not in Chichen Itza itself, but in the uh, caves of Balancanche. Could you tell us a little bit about these caves and what it is uh, you found there? Well, I will have to go back to the, to the, to the, to the times when I was just, when I was having Pozzoli with the, uh, with the workers of the, of the hotel. The leader of the workers of the, in the hotel, of the gardeners, I would say. The leader of the gardeners was a, a man by the name of Bernardino Tun. Everybody knew him as Bel Tun. And uh, he is the one whom I was talking to once, and he said, Betito is it. I was still a young boy. Uh, he said, you who like to explore and get lost in all of these places, there is a cave, he said, located, and I will tell you what he says. You go from here to the hotel, to a certain tree, and then you go to another cave, and you go here, and they, they give you all these directions by the trees that you're gonna that you're gonna find along your way. And he says, when you get around there, you're gonna see a very interesting cave, a big cave. And I said, thank you, Bertun. I said, next time I will go. I tried to find it several times, horseback riding. And probably walked by I went by many times without seeing it. It was impossible to see it. Um, it was precisely in 1959, to be exact, that uh, I was going to provide a guide service in the afternoon. And the people that I was guiding said, Beto, uh, we are very tired. The truth, we want to enjoy the pool. We have to go to Ushmal tomorrow. So go and do something. We're going to be by the pool. Well, that idea of saying, go and do something, what can you do in, in a place where there is nothing to do? <laughs> like Chichen Itza at that time, you see? Well, the only place for me to go was to a cave. And that was the cave where I had been going because of Mr. Beltun for years and years and years. To be honest, the first two times I tried to go into the cave, once I found it, once I saw it, as Mr. Bertun said, I asked for a, for a column and lamp to go inside. And I couldn't do it because I didn't know how to handle them. And I burned them both. So the first time that I got there by, by the instructions of Mr. Bertun, 
I couldn't go in and I could only sit down outside of the cage and look at it. And to me, it looked like a monster, something enormous, enormous. But I couldn't go in. I didn't know how to. So finally, during the next winter vacation that my grandmother brought me in, after the, the posadas were over, there were lots of, of the candles left. And I said, I'm going in with these candles. So I told him about the, the bag with all the candles. And I went to the cave. By that time, I knew how to get to the cave, but I had never been inside. So I went inside and put one candle. I walked and looked back. When I stopped seeing the candle, I put another one <laughs> and another one. And that's how come I went into the cave for certain distance looking at the candles in back, and I could find my way out. I kept on doing that for quite a while, several times. And each time I was going farther and farther and farther. Eventually I started going in with the flashlight. And eventually, within time, after so many thousands of hours that I spent inside of the cave, 13 years, I kept on going into it continuously, always digging here and digging there and finding broken pieces of pottery, little pieces of obsidian, little things like that. Mm -hmm. But nothing, nothing big and nothing other than the beautiful uh, stone formations that you have inside. Finally, in this, in this date, 1959, I decided to go. At that time, to be honest with you, I thought that I knew the cave as well as I know my hand, which I don't know it well. And I went inside directly to one of the tunnels where I had been many times before. I used to, I used to smoke a lot. I, I could see my cigarette butts right there. And I sat down with the flats on I started looking around, see, see where I was going to go and dig with my knife. When I started looking at the wall, and I kept on looking at it and I saw a pigmentation that was different from the rest of it. I thought, that wasn't there the last time I was here. I stood up and I started picking into it with the knife. As I was doing that, it started sweating. Drops of water started coming out. From the, from the wall. I kept on making the hole bigger and bigger and bigger. And I started removing stones and masonry that were inside. And I said, well, this is not the end of the cave. This is, this is a man-made wall. It's exactly like the, like the walls in the, in the buildings in Chichen Itza. So by removing more stones, I opened a hole. And uh, I decided to go inside and see what was there. So I put the first right, crawled in, crawled in, little by little, until I found myself standing up in front of a root, a tree root. And I started looking around with the first light. And to be honest, there was one moment when I noticed that the flashlight didn't throw the light far enough. The light went for maybe a yard or yard and a half, and it was blocked, like a, like a blanket right there. I was explaining later on that the cave had been sealed for so many thousands of years, or hundreds of years, that there was no atmospheric powder, and therefore the light couldn't travel. And the, now I know, but I didn't know at that time. Anyhow, my curiosity was to see what was behind it. There was a section of the cave of, of known to me. I had been going into the cave for 13 years, and I had never seen that new section. So I had to go farther. So I walked down, and I found that the tunnel, big, big tunnel in this place, was going farther and farther, so I kept on going. But actually, with the first light, 
on the ground. I couldn't throw it this way. I had to like this. So I actually walked for about uh, 300 yards and I happened to see that everything opened up again. And I started walking and I saw, the first thing that I saw was an enormous stalactite from the bottom, from the floor, all the way to the ceiling. I started walking around it and I happened to see that there was not one, there was another one next to it. And precisely between the first stalactite and the second one, put the flashlight, and there was this this path, this ceramic path, in the shape of, a, of an hourglass, with the mask of the rain god. Yeah. Well, look at this. <laughs> what was this? You know. And it's a very famous cover of a National Geographic magazine as well. So you're the first person to see this right. in hundreds of years, at least. It was painted half blue, half red. When I saw that, it's an impression very difficult to, to explain. Very difficult. Because I didn't expect that. I was used to the cave. But not knowing exactly you know, what was in there. And when I looked down, I was surprised to see so many different bases in a perfect order. How come I walked up to the, to the main pillar without knocking any of them? I don't know. And then I was very careful from then on to walk all the way around. I was 23 at the time. When I went around the second pillar, and I looked at it, I saw some handprints, and that was really scary. Not so much the mask of the rain god, but the handprints that were there. I don't know if it was because of the epoch when that happened, my age, or the idea of seeing something human in there. So after you made this discovery, you reported it to the authorities and... Not became... right away. Not right away, because after I went through, I got out and I went to Piste, which is the next village. Mm -hmm. And I acquired another flashlight, extra batteries, a rope, and I went back. And I stayed till about three o'clock in the morning. And I found seven chambers. Wow. All of them with artifacts, all of them in their original position. According to the, to the National Geographic, who made, who made a, an inventory, there are more than 600 artifacts in total. Uh, out of these uh, seven, seven chambers, only three can be visited today. The other four still have the artifacts there, eh? but they have no electricity. And many of them are practically of a difficult access because you cannot, I said, they haven't opened up enough for you to move to. Right. Uh, <clears throat> so what happened after that was uh, when I came out in the early morning, the only thing that I did was to, to pile up some stones over there. And I was so excited. I wanted to tell everybody what I had seen. But if I said, if I do that, then everybody will come in and they're going to destroy what is in here. This is intact. This, is, this has to be rescued before it is destroyed. So <clears throat> I went to, to the hotel about nine o'clock, picked up the people I was, I was guiding, and I came to Merida. I, I was to continue to Ushman, but while we made a stop, at the Barbachano's travel service office, I asked to, to talk to Don Fernando Barbachano Gomez Hulu. And I explained him what I had found. And he said, no, that cave has been explored. In 1936, it was explored. He said, it was explored, but not all of it. There is this and this and this and that over there. And I saw it. And it has to be rescued. I didn't want to believe me, 
But finally, I was able to convince him that it was that I had seen that. And he told me to take the people to Ushima, finish my tour with them over there, and drive back to the Chinese right away. And he was going to, uh, to talk to the proper people. So he is the one that made all the arrangements while I was going to Ushman and back to Kitchen. And he made arrangements with, uh, with the governor of Yucatan, with the uh, director of the electrical company, with uh, a pre-Islamic monument. There was no Ina at that time here. The Stanic Monument was in charge of all the archaeological zones. Uh, Doctor, was it Doctor Cardenas, Fernando Cardenas, uh, and two more people. And uh, he made an appointment, and he told me I was I was to go to Chichen and wait for them. So I went to Chichen Itza, and I stayed there until they arrived about. Uh, Midday, midnight, something like that. So when they arrived, I took them over and I showed them the first part. No, not all of it. The first part, uh, they brought uh, provisional lamps, cables, everything. And once the governor saw what was in there, immediately he sent orders to Valladolid and they brought a, a group of soldiers. And the soldiers at that exact moment started guarding the entrance to the uh, to the cave. So no one was to go in unless they had a strict uh, permission from the government. Well, thank you very much, uh, Don Beto, for your time, for telling us all these wonderful stories. And hopefully we'll be able to have you on again sometime and uh, you can share more of these uh, wonderful anecdotes with us. Again, thank you very much for your time. Well, the pleasure is mine. And, uh, anytime. <laughs> Real pleasure. Thank you so much. A pleasure. Thanks to everybody. Thank you. Thanks for watching.